Hello, this is Matthew Armstrong and welcome to Transformation Talk. Uh, in this interview, I have the great pleasure of speaking to Elena Tonetti Vladimirova. Elena produced and directed the revolutionary documentary Birth and the Being about the correlation between birth trauma and the quality of our lives. She also travels extensively teaching workshops on conscious birthing and birth trauma release. Uh, Elena, it is a great pleasure to be speaking with you, really. Um, it's, it's really opened our eyes. When we first saw your documentary, it's just absolutely in, incredible um, on Birth and the Being. And we were totally blown away by it and uh, just had to uh, speak with you and just learn more and uh, be able to share this with our, our members and uh, our subscribers, etc. So, um, so thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, and I really enjoyed how you said my last name without any problems. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, could, could we start off just to get a little bit of an understanding of, uh, you know, what conscious birthing is, how, how you got into it, maybe first of all, so your, your journey um, of getting into conscious birthing and how you came to be inspired to make your amazing documentary. Hmm. Well, it's a long journey. Um, two weeks ago, I actually celebrated my 30th anniversary dedicated to service the, um, this power of creation that allows us to come into this three-dimensional reality. Mm -hmm. I started mid-March in uh, 1982 mm -hmm. in Russia. Um, and at that time I had no idea um, about any of this. I was an actress and it was something that I thought that I would dedicate my life to. But then one conversation with the person who was pondering this for a very long time by then, Igor Cherkovsky, um, he was already playing with all of these ideas for about 20 years by then. And he shared with me about implications of the quality of our formative period on the quality of our life as a society and as I listened to them it felt like I was snapping off of some kind of hypnosis everything was becoming really clear and um, the understanding about about insanity of our life was basically clearing because uh, ever since I was becoming a thinking young adult um, I was wondering why do we live the way we live why are we so uncomfortable and sort of not right why do we live in uh, live life that is not right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and basically what he was saying was making sense he was explaining that somehow our nervous system acquires an equivalent of basic settings. You know, like in the, any computer or camera, there is those basic settings. Yep. And no matter what is uh, going on, uh, the outcome, the final product, will reflect those basic settings. Mm -hmm. So, I decided to just stop doing everything I'm doing and dedicate 100% of my um, resources, time and, and attention and my mental power and my emotional power to this subject to help the new generation to come in in a graceful, dignified, um, ecstatic, if you wish, mm. way so our basic settings would be for what we actually want, not what we were unconsciously programmed for. That makes sense, right? Yes, ab absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Go so, ahead. Yeah. Um, e e what, from what I heard from you talking before about Igor Chukovsky, he was a very um, un unusual human being. wasn't a regular human being. He was he was like uh, like a mystic or something. Is that right? Yeah, he was. Um, uh, well, he still is. He is in his mid seventies, but he is still as as charismatic as he always was. Um, Thirty years ago, uh, he was known, well known in Russia, as a healer, as a seer, um, 
just with with really extreme psychic abilities and mm -hmm. and i i don't really know how to talk about those things without the context of russia russia is actually a very mystical kind of country mm. there is uh, a lot of um influence from the east from mm. the um it it's not like here in america right so when when taken out of the context of russia of the 80s talking about Igor is very complicated because it, it, we don't have the same kind of mentality here. Mm -hmm. So, but given uh, you know his personality, he was very um, in in incongruent in the normal kind of routine, daily daily kind of um, situation of people. Being a seer doesn't really help being socially appropriate. Right. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So he's a very complex person, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, he the visions that he was perceiving that basically the way that society was functioning due to the programming on abandonment and loneliness provided by our birth houses, mm -hmm. which was at that time absolutely horrible, barbaric, um, inhumane, disgusting stop me somewhere because I can go on about um, breathing practices in Russia that were just there is no no explanation how something that horrible c could even come into existence mm -hmm. you know and he was saying the way we live reflects the way we're programmed yeah. so his he had a plan he had a plan. He said, let's change it and see what will happen, mm -hmm. because we already know what it looks like when it's this way. Mm -hmm. Let's try to see what will happen if we will change that. And the change was so dramatic. The change was so instant and amazing mm -hmm. that it absolutely made sense to keep doing this and do more of this, because the kids that were born without trauma were so amazing they were so bright and open and without any kind of slightest aggression in them mm -hmm. they, they displayed the qualities of common sense which is not very common you know right. <laughs> yeah uncommon sense yeah <laughs> and the main thing about them was that they did not really seem to be confused about their place in life. Mm -hmm. They did not have this questions about who I am, what am I doing here, why I, I am, you know, why am I here? Right. The questions that most of us are struggling for all our lives sometimes. Yeah. And these kids had clearly um, had clearly connected with something that made them so special. They were connected with that kind of I don't know uh, the place where where higher consciousness is. Mm -hmm. And in the eighties, we did not have any concept about it. We were really in the trial and error kind of pathway. Yeah. And um, what was puzzling for us, what we were recognizing, is that they're different somehow. Mm -hmm. So we needed to find a way of communicating with them in the way that didn't make us feel like we were some kind of dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was the sensation. It was the sensation when you look into their eyes, you could see that they're looking straight through you, through into your soul, mm. and understand you and see you for who you truly are. Yeah. And it was a very rare experience at mm. that time. Yeah. Nowadays, kids are born like that, left and right. Mm -hmm. But in those days, it was very, very, it was a spiritual experience. Yeah. You know, look into somebody's eyes and see 
a fully present awakened being mm -hmm. in there even though it was only a child yeah yeah um what what's 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 coming to me is that uh with uh, having a, a traumatic birth or a traumatic instance any time in life can uh, disconnect us from from our heart um, so we, we protect ourselves by disconnecting from from the heart and uh, um, I think that's maybe the difference that and what we're a lot of yeah. us are trying to do throughout throughout our lives is reconnect with it with our heart instead exactly. of being in the the programming of, of the head and uh, exactly. mm. there is that moment that is well known in psychology um, it's called dissociation um, in um, kind of street language it's called checking out <laughs> mm. it's a nature's very powerful mechanism of numbing us to the experience when it gets really really intense and when nervous system cannot digest it and cope with it mm -hmm. we check out yeah. and it's basically nature's mechanism to prevent the prey in the wild experience being being eaten alive mm -hmm. you know it's part of our mammalian nature every um, every uh, animal that can be eaten <laughs> in in the jungle mm -hmm. has that mechanism of dissociation that's why um, so many victims of horrible circumstances don't remember what exactly happened yeah. it's because our brain has that ability to disconnect mm -hmm. so imagine this is happening when you are a few seconds old when yeah. you're being received and treated in a way that is startling even just enough as a bright light or loud noise mm -hmm. never mind things like circumcision or shots when a big needle is penetrating this brand new skin yeah and in some research they say that the newborn is about 150 times more sensitive than an adult wow and uh, I, I know a lot of people would would say well I didn't have a traumatic birth but uh, the statistics show that um, I think is it 95 percent at least 95 percent is uh, of births are considered traumatic and uh, I think was it fifty percent of those are um, severe trauma? Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's um, Dr. William Emerson's statistics. Um, it's actually forty-five percent severe trauma and fifty percent as traumatic. Right. But then again, it all depends where you draw the line. Sure. You know what's your criteria? What, so what would be your criteria of it? Of what would you say is my traumatic? <laughs> my criteria is, I have a bar very high. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so um, my criteria, anything other than bliss, mm. is traumatic for mm. the newborn. Yeah. My criteria is when the baby is born uh, without anxiety and fear on mother's part when it's welcoming and um, when there is this high re high frequency of completely relaxed loving soft environment mm -hmm. this is my understanding of what every baby deserves yeah so um, then we just go down and be realistic <laughs> you see um, you see you, we have many different levels of well-being for example if someone just jogs for 15 minutes in the morning for their own health that's good right mm -hmm. and then there is Olympic team that can do things that a few people can do mm -hmm. so I think that we really don't need to become Olympic champions every one of us right but do something 
something that within our parameters of uh, availability, capacity, accessibility, just at least even having an intention to have to provide the new child with the most comfort, the most sensation of safety, just even being aware that everything that both parents are experiencing, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they're eating, what they're not doing and not eating, mm -hmm. is directly transmitted to a child. Yeah. On every level, mentally, emotionally, mechanically, chemically, um, socially, every single experience is being received by the baby from the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. Not some time later when yeah. they, you know, grow up and to be of age seven, when we can talk to them and reason with them. No, actually, the more research there is in this field, then the borders go low, uh, earlier and earlier and earlier. It used to be believed that birth trauma is only related to the circumstances of birth, actual birth. Right. But latest research in neurobiology shows that basically it actually starts a few months before conception. Hmm. Not even at conception. Interesting. Yeah, a few months before conception because what both a man and a woman did and ate and exercised, whether they did drugs, whether they uh, were too tired, whether they were too, um, you know, <sighs> active, mm -hmm. whatever it was that their life was challenging them with, defines the quality of the egg and the sperm mm. yeah. to the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. And even though the basic kind of basic, basic volume of criteria is established from the moment the woman was in her gestation inside her mother, mm -hmm. when she was a four months fetus in her mom, that's when a woman's eggs are forming. Right. So you know um, those Russian matryoshka dolls. Those mm. nesting dolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is basically a metaphor. <coughs> excuse me, metaphor for us people. Mm -hmm. That um, my daughter's my my daughter was inside my body when I was inside my mother's body. When <laughs> when her mother was inside of her grandmother's body. Wow. <laughs> that's that's um, hard. To really comprehend that, the that's, that's, inter mm. interrelation of all the stories, and basically the premise of my work that I dedicate my life to is that most of the complications at birth have their origins in the past life of this woman, which means it could be the past experience of her mother of or of her great 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 grandmother okay how, how does that work <laughs> that's how it works because we're all so closely overlapping each other yeah that something that the great great mother experienced you know hundreds of years ago was showing as a scar in her psyche mm -hmm. transmitting into her pregnancy and her child was gestating in that kind of hormonal cocktail that she was generating yeah yeah and that is basically how anxieties travel in the family mm -hmm. you know that um, absence of love can be shown on x-ray really yeah. How, and in, in what form? How does it show up in an x-ray? It shows as a deep, dense lines in bones. Right. Huh. Because, um, because when a woman is stressed out and she's pregnant, mm -hmm. the building of the baby's body goes on hold. Right. 
So we as a species actually can get away with quite a bit of a, a stress level because mm -hmm. in the wild there is no guarantees and there is really no um, kind of um, place to hide, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, If you're in the wild, it's available for everybody. Yep. So we can tolerate a lot of stress level, but it comes in a very short um, kind of spurs in the wild. When the pregnant deer needs to run away, mm -hmm. her chase is very short. Yeah. She either runs away or she is getting caught. Mm. So with short bouts of, of anxieties and fears, our body knows how to cope. But if the stress level has some kind of cumulative effect, right. when it builds up one on top of each other, yep. then those pauses become uh, too long for the body to handle. And it starts skipping the building um, building process. You know, if you're building a kitchen mm -hmm. and suddenly you get an, uh, a warning that a flood is coming or an earthquake, you're just going to get out of there. You're not going to continue building your kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all very simple. So if a pregnant woman is stressed out, the baby will know. Yeah, so so conscious and birth. Yeah, and historically, we don't really have a very good track record of peaceful gestation hmm. due to enormous amount of wars and, and diseases and, and uh, domestic violence, which was a norm, basically, mm -hmm. until quite recently, domestic violence was something quite socially acceptable mm -hmm. when yeah. pregnant woman would be beaten mm -hmm. by her husband or even the mother of the husband. Right. Plus on top of it, um, historically lots of women were given as wives before they even became childbearing age. It's only quite recently again mm -hmm. in the last couple of centuries that women were of um, sort of decent age to <laughs> become brides and wives even though even right now in many countries in Asia child brides are still quite a, a prominent experience yeah. for many women. So, so yeah. th this is going to be imprinted down the th through the, the, the from the grandparents to the mother to the, the next generation through the generations really right? Yeah, yeah, basically every time a woman was hit mm. it records on some level somewhere. Yeah. And th this is getting and into the limbic um s system. Could you talk a little bit about the, the the limbic system, the limbic imprinting and what that is, how that works? Yeah, this I I believe it needs to be in the health ed classes in junior high school. It has to be common knowledge because it has such a um, such a direct um, impact on the quality of our life. You mm -hmm. see, when um, Mr. Freud declared that a person is only a person when they can memorize and cognitively remember and articulate themselves, it was a setup for um, a lot of lost battles in our kind of collective psyche mm -hmm. because cognitive memory to which he referred to is only sort of uh, governed by the cortex what we used to understand is our brain mm -hmm. but cortex is not governing everything that we are right. there is also limbic system of the brain that is governing our emotions and feelings and sensations our ability to love somebody or our inability to love is not a cognitive function mm -hmm. you know how sometimes we know people who uh, are really struggling with relationships when they know that they should be loving their spouse but that it's such a great person but they just don't mm -hmm. it's a very 
confusing and complicated situation when one part of the brain is playing against the other part and what happens is that I understand I respect you but I'm limbically imprinted my emotions are recognizing something else as my comfort zone for example if we take the storybook situation if a woman's father for example was an alcoholic mm -hmm. there goes her attraction to one alcoholic boyfriend after another and even though in her mind she understands that it's not good for her mm -hmm. but the attraction you know that something that makes her feel alive mm -hmm. is with those guys under the influence that's who she falls for yeah and um that's basically what happens because in limbic system there is no logic logic is in cortex which is in a completely different place mm -hmm. in 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 our kind of in our anatomy but then there is also reptilian brain right. it's right here on top of our spinal cord mm -hmm. it's that part of the brain that we share with snakes and crocodiles that's the part of the brain that forms the first in the fetus and is responsible for pure physiology mm -hmm. that is not really uh, again a thinking part yeah. that's the part that does the birthing that's right. the part that does all the um, opening of the cervix mm -hmm. and um, it's been known um, in um, historical situations when a woman would be impregnated when she's in a coma for example she would be able to conceive a child and actually gestate to full term mm -hmm. while pregnant wow. wh while in coma right yeah yeah because that's the the pure physiology is building mm -hmm. um, quite you know without us having to think yeah. how to digest my food I don't need to read a book about how to pump the blood in my body so that's reptilian brain yeah so ideally all those parts of the brain need to function harmoniously mm. so they cooperate and support each other and help each other mm -hmm. but if we get um, kind of traumatized during the formative period they split and disconnect and then they by themselves don't know how to get back together yeah how, how to not contradict and compete with each other mm -hmm. instead of cooperating yeah yeah so so w what's some of the practicalities of conscious birthing what does the woman need to uh, need to know need to do to uh, to, to align these different uh, parts of the brain and uh, to to, to 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 go through some sort of healing <sighs> that's a big question and right. the basic answer is anything anything she can get her hands on <laughs> okay and for some women it could be one things and for other women it could be other things that th that's the thing that there is no general answer because every woman is in a different situation but a few general guidelines um, I can offer you know with uh, adjustment to local situation local medical history local family history um, her own karmic history which is a whole other ball game to deserving a whole other talk yeah so um, the basic guidelines guideline is that a woman would generally give birth the way she was born mm -hmm. so she needs to find out what happened with her when she was fetus when she was a baby when uh, her mom was thinking about conceiving her what kind of relationships she had with her father mm -hmm. so basically the research shows that emotional um, emotional landscape in the family has the priority of the impact on the baby right. 
basically, even when a woman is in good physical shape and she's eating right, but she's in deep conflict with the father of the baby, mm. that's where the source of possible complications will arise. Yeah. But the conflict also didn't start from, you know, out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That conflict has its own origins. Yeah. So basically, uh, she needs to take a good look at her emotional, psychological, spiritual, mental, sexual history. Sexual history is a big player in this game because at the end of the day she will have to give birth and open her body mm. in a way that if there was for example a rape mm. in there that it would be um, that the physiology would have a really hard time surrendering to that kind of opening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, it's a lot of things to look at if there is a lot of things to look at. Yeah, yeah. There are a few women out there that have this charmed life mm -hmm. and, you know, everything is unfolding be beautifully and perfectly in their life and there was no really much of a drama when they were loved by their parents and they have a beautiful partner and they preparing consciously for conceiving a child there are those people right <laughs> yeah yeah and maybe i'm looking at one of them mm -hmm. who knows but the great majority is still is um struggling yeah struggling with their conditioning conscious and unconscious with their history with their mother's history with their grandmother's history so in that case we really need to see what um, what we what we're dealing with so in in my workshops I came up with a very effective program I looked hard and long for 30 years mm -hmm. at everything basically there is out there and came up with a very kind of with a shortcut mm -hmm. <laughs> because sometimes I have to work with women who are in their last trimester or even in their last couple weeks before the due date so my quest was always how to get there fast right and um, and um, you know looking for 30 years for anything you you're bound to find something sure, right sure so I found a lot of answers to that but the still the shortest way I can help somebody it takes about two weeks takes mm -hmm. about 15 16 hours because it's something that you build upon it's not a magic bullet it's not something I can say you can do that will just open up and have a permanent shift per yeah. permanent or at least long-lasting mm -hmm. effect. If you want a long-lasting effect, you need at least a couple hours, right? <laughs> or in my case, <laughs> um, at least a couple of days. Yeah. When you co combine a very specific techniques that are um, involving breathing, a very specific movement, very specific kind of guidance that allows you to uh, shift into slightly altered state mm -hmm. because you can't really talk your way through your um, imprint. The process is not really just one process, it's a chain of processes, exercise experiences mm -hmm. that are designed to trigger all the different parts of the brain, cortex, reptilian and the limbic system. Mm -hmm at the same time so right. the nervous system could create a reference point what would it feel like if it all will be completely aligned parts of our brain and all the different aspects of our personality are not competing with each other but instead 
coordinating and cooperating and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. So um, that includes a quite elaborate kind of chain of experiences that leads a person into this slightly altered state of being mm -hmm. uh, where the person can have access to a much larger menu of options and decisions and choices and different level of self-awareness that comes with um, just very, very powerful quality of presence that this person experiences mm -hmm. without using any substance, you know, without being on on anything, just um, just creating the reference point in the nervous system basically is the um, most accurate description that I can offer to you right now because imagine that that if you if you never knew what it would feel like to be truly loved mm -hmm. to feel absolutely safe and comfortable with another person then how would you get yourself into that place yeah because normally when we um, are not wired for this kind of experience we're not even able to attract a person who would be able to offer that kind of experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's sort of catch-2020 that um, in order for us to even attract the person with whom we can be on that level of communion mm -hmm. we need to create this kind of opening within our own heart within our own mind to even imagine that kind of connection with somebody yeah yeah and I, I, I think from, my, from my, my own experience of seeing um, my own understanding before of birth and now my understanding what I've, what I've learned in even these past uh, number of months is just uh, it's a massive difference it's like black, black and white really and it, it really is I think it's just an, a new awareness um, a, sh a shift in perception how, how I now perceive uh, birth through growing up and being told that mm -hmm. it's a very traumatic experience, um, you know, especially for my own mother's traumatic births, and then seeing it through the through movies and TV, where it's always this this really melodramatic traumatic thing that happens, and then um, more recently, and still and having an understanding that uh, birth is an important is an important thing and it does affect us as as we mm -hmm. grow up is actually from seeing uh, specifically I think the biggest impact on me was watching your your documentary and and seeing that and just going wow you know and and it seeing the the difference because you show some shots of being in the hospital where this it's gone through a traumatic birth and then some of the water births in the sea and in the tanks etc and the difference is just so huge and uh, y you can just see the difference between having a, you know, like you say, a blissful birth and a traumatic birth, and it, it really is just uh, a lot of its awareness and getting this sh shift in perception, where I might have posted a, a a video on Facebook of what would be considered what I would consider a traumatic birth, where mm -hmm. the, there's very strong lights around, lots of noise, lots of people yeah. talking. The baby gets pretty much pulled out, and uh, then the hard rubbing of the cloth, um, straight away cutting the 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 cord, and then the the nurse saying, you know, oh, you be okay, and you know, being very loud and to to the baby and throwing it around, and to me that was very very traumatic. And when I posted it, other people said, I don't see a problem with that. That's normal. Exactly. And, and it's just from from their perception of their thinking mm -hmm. well what's wrong with that you know if, if someone got a cloth and rubbed it hard on me it wouldn't make me traumatized but they're seeing it from their own perspective and they're not seeing it as this new being that's just being in a cocoon for nine months and suddenly is in this totally new environment where it, like you said it's 150 times more sensitive than an adult so right it, imagine that cloth being 150 times more 
rough on your skin. Yes, so it's it's that awareness and that perception that I think is the um, the, the biggest shifter um, for me anyway. That was that was my experience of seeing that, seeing the contrast, and uh, then that was a, a realization for me for sure. Yeah, that's the thing that we upgraded our barbaric practice into a status of norm hmm. and uh, being highly suggestive beings we are now perceiving it as uh, as there is nothing wrong with it hmm. but from the perspective of the baby of a brand new baby where every nerve ending is a brand new uh, being you know <laughs> it's all so raw and open it's not right it's hmm. not right, and that's the thing that um, uh, an average young person, by the time they have their own baby, is exposed to over a hundred episodes of those horrible births in the movies and the soap opera right. uh, stories of their friends and relatives, and and we are sort of conditioned into perceiving it as norm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so something else I was really surprised at is the amount of uh, pe people that have circumcision that that's normal and up until not so long ago it was 90% in, in the US and now I think it's still 50% 95% yeah right. um, 95% and fortunately enough uh, you know I hear it's, it's come down quite a bit but still at least 50% of children of boys have circumcision um, and just before it's just a you know, it's a word, but once you actually see it on a video, how it's done and the the pain the child goes through, um, that was dis disturbing for, for for me to see that. Um, you know, what what effect does that have on on a child growing up um, in life, having that that done to them? Well, yeah, that's the thing. This uh, the most sensitive part in the body. There is nowhere else in the body that there is such sensitivity mm -hmm. because it's a very specific erogenous nerve endings mm -hmm. in that tiny fold of skin there's 20,000 of them mm -hmm. and uh, the doctor is just cutting with scissors right through those 20,000 erogenous nerve endings without any anesthesia without, without, without um, any consideration to what the child is feeling mm -hmm. and um, there is no explanation to that because it's not recommended, it's not necessary, it's not done in Europe, in in Russia. I never even saw a circumcised man until I came to America. Mm. So my heart goes out to all those boys that were tortured, basically. This is the most exquisite torture there is mm. on human body. And um, there is no justification for it. What's the like psychological, emotional implications of of this, and uh, as a child growing up and becoming an adult? Well, um, it it crosses the wires, and the brain uh, sort of confuses pain and pleasure. Mm -hmm. So, lots of um, sexual and behavioral patterns are established where pain and pleasure is confused. Mm -hmm. So, um, it has vast implications, much more vast than we can possibly cover in this interview. Right. But on my website, I have a big article that is called Circumcision when I address this issue. And uh, also, there is uh, a site, nocirc.org, specifically dedicated to this issue. So please educate yourself mm. and um, do whatever you can to rescue future boys yeah. from this experience. Yeah. Yeah. The main implication is that it creates a dissociation, mm -hmm. basically, what we were talking about. If the first experience of being in the body is this agony it's bound to create the deep deep disconnect mm -hmm. of of uh, the body with the feeling with emotion with uh, ability to trust to love mm -hmm. to 
relax ability to actually discern up and down right and wrong right it's yeah. it's a very the implications are so vast mm -hmm. that it really exceeds the format of this interview okay yeah uh, can we can we touch a little bit on um on c section because some things i was just totally amazed by is that uh that up to 95% in some countries C-section yeah. and where it's seen as a, as, as, a, as a really good thing and people will even pretend that they've had C-sections to have more uh, prestige or status etc. Um, yeah, circumcision is viewed as um, as prestigious experience when the family was able to uh, oh, sorry yeah. Uh, C-section, yeah. In most third world countries, it's reaching 95, 90, 85 percent. And a woman in Brazil told me that there is a whole um, specific kind of social status onto circumcision to the point that women tattoo scars on their bellies if they were not able to afford one. Mm. Because sometimes the family is saving for many years or sometimes going into debt that they will be paying off for many many years to come to have c-section mm -hmm. and um, it's really really um, crazy it, that's the, the yeah. technical term I can come up with yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's a major abdominal surgery mm -hmm. that is necessary to save life when it's really some some serious medical condition yeah. um, that has again vast emotional psychological implications for the baby for the mother for their bonding their attachment for their physical kind of well-being there are so many studies that show um, how much more dangerous c-section is versus um, normal delivery, mm -hmm. natural, even home delivery. There is enormous amount of studies with different criteria and they vary in the outcome. Some of them say C-section is three times more dangerous. Some some of them are saying it's up to 26 times more dangerous. Right. Um, but even if it's only three times more dangerous, mm. the, the, the mildest ones, yeah that come up with that amount, it's still, why are we doing this again? Right. You know, just because, um, why again? <laughs> you know, this is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so some, sometimes it's just so insane that it's, you know, words don't uh, d explain it. Um, but yeah, but uh, the main problem is that basically in medical schools they don't have it as part of their curriculum of explaining the side effects of c-section they actually most of the doctors believe that c-section is a birth trauma free delivery hmm. Hmm. which is absolutely um, it's the highest degree of ignorance right I, I don't have an explanation to that because the research is available for the last 20 years mm -hmm. how damaging c-section is that it should be only used in real emergencies a lot of uh, women would b believe that uh, the doctors told them nurses told them that they needed a c-section but from what i've come across what i've read and what i've seen is that um quite often it is the actual going to the hospital and the practices that happen um in the hospital that actually lead to the necessity of a c-section or um for whatever reason and because of the doctors conditioning and programming they just see it as the the, the, be the best route yeah you see again I can't generalize because there are situation when it's necessary mm -hmm. and if a woman did not do her homework if she did not really um, neutralize her own birth trauma and she's anxious and very uneasy and doesn't really believe that she would do it then it's very likely that she would not be able to do it mm -hmm. because uh, it's no coincidence that in indigenous cultures 
um, men had a lot of right passages that would sort of mark the the time when a boy becomes a man. Yeah, yeah. But there is really no rites of passages for women because um, for a woman that's giving birth, that's her initiation into womanhood. Mm -hmm. And it means that it's not just something um, that you sort of approach lightly, even in indigenous societies, they understood that for giving birth, you really need to um, come together as a tribe with your sisters, with your family, with um, with some kind of that you need to fall back on onto some kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. And while they did not view giving birth as a drama or or something. Um, out of context of life, it was seen always as a continuum, as that's what you do when you grow up, you go through your stages, then at some point you give birth and another birth. So, um, in our society, this whole continuum kind of approach is lost. And we don't really have a very good education to help women understand what it means to be a woman, to be um, a pregnant woman to become a mother what we have now that kind of baby shower level uh, an equivalent of acknowledging pregnancy and approaching delivery is not really doing uh, for the emotional part of um, a woman helping her deal with all the questions that she has in the, world, the fears that come up mm -hmm. so in that context of highly stressful, anxious way that we approach ourselves and, and our procreation, you know, there is no one answer that can help a woman avoid C-section. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, a long process of self-discovery, of soul-searching, of claiming her power that she needs to arrive to that point of confidence and being really grounded and centered, really know herself, really know her needs, educate herself about um, different options and different different um, experiences that she might be about to face. Mm -hmm. So even if there is imminent C-section and she's going into that with open eyes for some kind of medical condition, it still could be conscious birth. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm not promoting water birth or home birth or any kind of specific way of delivery. What I am promoting is, is being conscious of the implications of your daily choices and, and, um, and state of being. Yeah. that is your basic modus operandi. So even C-section can be conscious birth. Yes. When you write your plan and you stick to it and, and find people and that can really support the environment in the hospital, in the emergency room or in the operation room, when the lights actually can be deemed, they don't need to be blasting it, uh, you know, 300 sons capacity, mm -hmm. you know, you don't need that kind of brightness. You just need to be able to see well, yeah. really well, but it doesn't have to be in thousands of watts. Mm -hmm. It's um, the noises. You can really negotiate your way into turning it down. You can negotiate your way that the baby is not whisked away and not um, separated the umbilical cord doesn't have to be cut immediately and the baby could go on mother's um, chest and to you know introduce to the nipple even right after c-section right. so there is still a lot of things that can be done mm -hmm. but also prior to that experience a woman really needs to know about the stages of the of birth she needs to educate herself mm 
if she was not born well. Those who were born well, by definition, they can just give birth, you know, when it comes time, they get quiet and they open up and let the baby out. Mm -hmm. But if she was not born well, there is still a lot that she can do in order to avoid possible complications and some guy coming and telling her that she is incapable of doing it. You see, most doctors are male and just by definition, they don't have what it takes to understand the process of birth. Mm -hmm. A male doesn't have um, neurobiology, the hormones, the anatomy to relate to the process of giving birth. So if a doctor who went through medical school and read lots of books about it, it doesn't really make him know anything about it. You see, for example, you would watch um, a highly psychological, complex drama in Chinese. Mm -hmm. That's about the level of understanding that male doctor has about what a woman is going through. Mm -hmm. He can see her but he can't really understand what she's going through. Yeah. But for 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 all of us, um, I, I believe it's 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 important to to understand the the importance of conscious birthing, so you know we can pass pass this on to our own children and to our family and um, and also to be able to heal our own. Uh, past trauma uh, as well because I as, as I understand it um, it's not just women that go to your workshops it's also men go to your workshops to heal their birth trauma is that right yes and I also want to add a little bit about men being present in birth because I don't want to leave it hanging uh, on what I just said about male doctors because um, there is a lot of men that um, experience presence at their baby's birth that they recall as the most profound spiritual experience that they ever had in their life that really was their rite of passage that activated their um, fatherhood, their capacity to love this woman, the mother of their child and connect with the baby so directly and have this primal bonding with their child mm -hmm. you know this kind of man would not want to miss uh, this experience in their life and there is also the kind of man that for example still full of their own anxiety from their own birth trauma so the presence of that kind of man in the delivery room actually creates actually could be the source of possible complications because the birthing field in the room basically reflects and multiplies all the emotional cocktail that is present in that moment. Yeah. So it's not about whether men should be or should not be in the room. It's about anybody who is full of anxieties about the the birthing energy mm. should not be present there whether it's a man or it's a woman's own mother mm. or sister or best girlfriend you know their heart could be in the right place but their their body uh, could be absolutely terrified of birth and generating the pheromones of um, fear mm -hmm. which will affect the birthing field right yeah yeah, so it's very important to select consciously the birthday party. <laughs> Who is it that um, a woman will be inviting mm -hmm. um, in the delivery room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's 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 wonderful, and I I would just recommend everyone to um, go to your website and. And watch it and download, watch your buy your DVD, um, 
Birth yeah, the, buy my DVD. <laughs> abs- absolutely, really, you know. Um, every, it's available every, in 12 yeah. languages now. Okay. I'm so <laughs> proud of it because it basically just happened spontaneously. It was uh, translated by volunteers in those countries without me even, you know, looking for it or asking. Every once in a while there would be this email, oops, I translated your movie, is it okay? <laughs> of course it's okay. <laughs> it just tells me how much true request for this kind of work is out there. Yeah. That women all over the world is is really aching to know themselves, to have some kind of guidance and access to this information. So please, there is so much information on my website. Yeah, it's birthintobeing.com, right? Birthintobeing.com. Yeah. And one thing that I just really loved on the on the DVD as well was the birthing with the dolphins. Um, I, I just thought that was just in- incredible. Um, could could you talk just for a minute on that and just you know what what's that all about? <laughs> oh God, we lost it. We were um, learning from each pregnant couple that would come um, and um, try to work with us, and, and we were basically. Uh, creating this whole program together because we didn't have anybody to ask questions Mm -hmm. but of course it helped that Igor was uh, a seer that he would uh, start working with a woman and sort of put her in some kind of trance and together they would piece together uh, her mother's kind of history and her grandmother's history and I witnessed amazing amazing situations when some um, severe symptomatic kind of uh, experience would be resolved just by going to the origins and um, with Igor's healing powers, I'm sorry but I, I just don't know how else to, to mm. talk about those things it would be resolved and um, but uh, when a woman would go in, a pregnant would go into this deep trance so many of them, basically every one, every other one, would be sharing that she was uh, would be seeing dolphins around her. That that even when she would not know what they looked like, she would just describe this big gray fish, kind of playfully jumping. Wow. And we're talking about you know in the dead winter in Siberia or in Moscow. It's in, in California. Dolphins are kind of signature mark, and they're everywhere. Mm. And, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, kind of new age symbol. Mm. But at that time in the 80s, dolphin was a fish. You know, it's like, and why were they all seeing the fish all of a sudden? So at some point, Igor decided that we need to go and find the dolphins and figure out what's going on, why there is this recurring theme uh, coming from so many different women. So um, it took three years though before we actually managed to have it happen and we had an expedition to the Black Sea and had this most powerful, fantastic experience of delivering a few babies that first year but the connection with dolphins was very um, was very kind of scarce because at this point dolphins were not really very trusting of people mm-hmm. the only experience of people they had was the fisheries and um, the those big boats where they were treated like fish yeah. um, so they were not very open to connecting with us and um, the second year there were some miracles. The second year, they somehow discerned that we were different and were making themselves available. And it was the most profound, amazing experience. Um, But still, they only allowed pregnant women to come close and swim with them and even sometimes touch them. Mm. Um, But... um, nobody else, whoever was not pregnant. (laughs) But that was a a very profound experience when when a woman would go into labor 
and it is in the middle of nowhere you mm -hmm. see we needed to find a place where, where it would be clean warm very private and uh, some kind of a lagoon that would be protected from big waves um, so in order to find a place like that that would be private enough we needed to go in the middle of nowhere so um, with each new birth there would be this you know agitation when the next woman would go into labor in the middle of the night usually hmm. and then the dolphins would come very soon after that kind of birthing energy would start pulsating in the camp mm -hmm. and they would come and they would just stay and sing and jump and play very close yeah. as close as the um, depth would allow and what we noticed was that this anxiety and slight agitation would absolutely subside as soon as they would arrive it would change the whole atmosphere in the camp and everyone would be just relaxed and, and, and joyful and very clear that it's all going to be good and beautiful and well, that nothing, nothing bad is going to happen. It was really amazing. And it was true. We never had any problems. Wow. That's the thing. We never had um, even a tear, mm -hmm. it, which was a good thing, because we wouldn't know what to do about it. It's looking back, I am terrified. Wow, it's a, su such a cor <laughs> courageous move. <laughs> no, I think um, because none of us had medical education, we didn't really have all those pictures of pathologies and and possible complications we didn't really know what can go wrong and the thing is it was not come on everybody it was a very selected kind of by personal invitation group of people who went through the whole program of preparation mm -hmm. during winter in Moscow and um, there was no strangers so the only people who went there were people who were actually originally even drawn mm -hmm. to this kind of work and this kind of experience who were um, passionate and really healthy enough yeah. to even step into this uh, in the first place yeah. so as I was speaking earlier that was an equivalent of Russian birthing Olympics mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. it was yeah. a very very selected group of women and I'd cool. say it would have to be very intuitive, like an intuitive call to yes. go do it and for yourself as well yes. to uh, facilitate it as well. Right, and there had to be a certain degree of self-confidence even to begin with, yeah. to, to, to think about going there. Yeah. So, um, so, so we had amazing experience, wow. you know, we, even though uh, Sometimes I think, what were we thinking? You know? <laughs> that's it. But that's that's the like the conscious mind trying to analyze it. I but, know. But the, the I intu know. The intuition would have would have guided you at, at that time. But after trying to analyze it, yeah, I, I understand I what were we thinking. Yeah. But we were young. We were passionate, mm -hmm. fearless, um, just adventurous, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and it all looked absolutely normal you know for me personally I was one of the organizers of those camps um, for me personally that was more normal than anything else yeah because the stories that I heard about those birth houses that that um, my mother told me and my aunties and my older friends who went there they were so terrifying. They, it's just barbaric. You know, yeah, I could not understand why would somebody want to go there in the first place. See, for me, going to the Black Sea and and and, but 
in this situation, going into the forest would look normal, or just, you know, giving birth on the back seat of the camp is more normal <laughs> than going to one of those facilities. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you, have you, do you know any of the children who were, who were born All with the dolphins? Do you, know, do you know them growing up, what they're like? Yes. Um, are they much different to other kids or other humans? <laughs> Of course I know them, they're children of my friends and we're still connected and the oldest of them are now having children of their own so we have a second generation of these amazing people and uh, um, they are amazing, mm -hmm. they're amazing. I already uh, spoke about it a little bit in the beginning but um, also bear in mind that they actually had to go and face that Soviet reality that was their only option. They had to go into Soviet school and deal with all the crazy kind of twilight zone of um, this Soviet kind of school system, right. which, which was a, a very challenging experience. So they got they got a, a very complex, kind of complicated journey mm -hmm. being as sensitive and, and psychic as they were they could not understand why they had to put up with so much crazy crazy stuff yeah, yeah so and we did not know the extent uh, the extent <laughs> Oops, sorry. Extend? Extend, yeah. 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 Uh, it's my second language, so uh, <laughs> forgive me <laughs> for those lapses every once in a while. Yeah, we also did not know the extent of their sensitivity, so uh, we didn't start treating them with special care right away. So we were learning. Mm. Um, so you know there is no simple answer to your question um, because each story was different and life in Russia was very complex especially when uh, all this economic collapse and um, Russia went through a nightmare in mm -hmm. the late 80s early 90s mm -hmm. that the time of their childhood so, so there is no one answer your question but what I um, want to end our interview with yeah. is that at this point on planet earth we have a critical mass of this new beings born without trauma mm -hmm. new human beings that are the way we are supposed to be that are connected with the source in the way that we all meant to be connected with the source. Yeah. That are not disso not dissociated, are not scared of life of themselves, of their power. We have that critical mass now on this planet. And this is a really good news. What it really means is that the end of the world has been cancelled. <laughs> right. And yes. I, I, I really you know uh, about this hundred monkey effect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you heard this um, kind of psychological metaphor, hundred monkey effect? Yes, it reaches a tipping point whenever right. so, so many people we do the something. People, we the people reached the tipping point. We've reached it. It's already happened. <laughs> we won. <laughs> we won. <laughs> the war is over. And this is my main message, that now we just need to learn to live. Yeah. We uh, need to upgrade our own nervous system so we can face those amazing beings that are now embodied and are present with us. So we know how to teach them, how to communicate with them, how to support their childhood and uh, developmental stages, how to teach them. Um, you know, in a different way mm -hmm. than we were taught. Mm -hmm. How we can protect them from being sort of hammered into forgetting who they are. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the task at hand. Yeah. And mm. I love I love what it says on the front of your website where it says uh, peace on earth begins at birth. Um, yeah. It's um, actually a Janine Parvati Baker, one of the pioneers of this conscious birth movement. It's not my phrase, that's hers. Right. But I it basically summarizes everything I just said. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's that's where the start of it is. That's where the, the 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 root of our traumas come from, and that's what needs to be healed with ourselves and with our future generations. Um, doing that, and you're you're doing wonderful work, Elena, and uh, making a big difference around the world. And your doc documentary that the more people that see it, the better, for sure. So uh, oh, thank you very yes. much for everything you're doing. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you. Pleasure talking with you, you too. Thank you.